Today I bring a series on the person and work of the Holy Spirit to a close. This will be the 20th message. <clears throat> I believe that um, 20 messages could not exhaust the subject. It only is kind of a look into. It's not a definition. My message is found in Galatians 5, so if you wish to turn there and follow along. And the whole book, this whole book, the design of the book is to bring people back who were converts of Paul, who were born of the faith, back to the faith. And there's a great emphasis on the spirit for good reason. Now, before I get started in reading the fifth chapter, let me just say one thing. It's very easy for people to be misled, especially people who are open to the things of God. You ever wonder how it's possible that great multitudes gather in places purportedly as houses of worship, and yet they're fed very little from the Word of God. How is that possible? But it happens every single Sunday and multiple times during the week. And first you might say, well, blame the saints because they're not doing their part. Well, that's true. They should be in the Word. Blame the preacher. Well, yes, there's a blame right there. But it's possible for people to be misled, even those who essentially have their hearts set in desiring the best that God has to offer, because it's the nature, our nature, our flesh nature, to be lazy, to follow what will work for the self, and to take the easy way out. I guarantee you if I stood here and said, instead of saying, those born of the promise and of faith, instead of saying, shall suffer persecution like it was in Isaac and Ishmael's day and as it was in Paul's day and as it was in Luther's day and it is in my day, instead of saying that, if I said, those who are born of the faith and of the promise, they will live a great, happy life. Do you suppose that there would be more people listening, because I just said something that sounds good? Of course. Then again, that separates out those people who are earnestly desiring the kingdom of God and seeking it with all their heart through the scriptures, through the spirit, versus those that they have an idea, but they're quite indifferent. And this is how people are misled all the day long. It was in Paul's day, so I'm going to start reading in the fifth chapter. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. and Be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. And he's referring back to the law, as those that came to Galatia wanted to bring people back to the law. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he's a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you're fallen from grace. Remember he said the, school, the law was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, to bring us to faith that when Christ is formed in our heart by faith, we no longer need that schoolmaster. We have, why would you want the shadow and the sentence of death when you could have the substance and the substance of life, not merely just some form or shadow. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. You did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? Now, this is often read over and glossed through, but he's essentially speaking some pretty harsh words to the Galatians. He says, you started good. 
Who's stopping you from obeying the truth? Now, in our vernacular today, the word obey, anybody that hears that, they, they coil back. And perhaps it's, like I said, in our language, it carries other connotations. But obeying the truth that is in Christ, my late husband said, he, he broke down the word obedience, running to the voice of the sayer. And I think that's probably the best way to explain that, to not make it some systematic rule book, but rather, if I claim to be following after the one who saved me, who is the Savior, who is the one, I'm earnestly desiring to follow after what he said. It doesn't mean that I may perform or I may do the doing of, because quite frankly, no one can, even in the New Testament dimension. Without the Spirit of God, Christ says, without me, you can do nothing. But he says, Paul says, you did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. This isn't the thing from God. These are people. This is man's idea, not God's. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Boy, is not a true statement. I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. And I pray that you take these words to yourself as well, as there are many people who fancy themselves spiritually greater than you, more knowledgeable, oh, they'd abase you and roll over you with a tractor in a minute if they could, and normally they do verbally anyway, and they think they're spiritual. I love what he says. He says, the person that's troubling you, he's going to bear his own judgment, whoever he is or whoever she is, whatever they are. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision... Why do I yet suffer persecution? This is a question for the ages. I even stand here and feel very akin to what Paul is saying here. If he's preaching the law, question mark, the man who is the, the greatest heralder of grace, if he's preaching the law, why is he being persecuted? It's a great question to ask. Then... Is the offense of the cross ceased? In other words, if I'm standing here and I'm preaching do-do and don't do and that pacifies those who came in who were the do-doers, then why am I still suffering? Yeah, I know, I agree with you. Because <laughs> there's a whole lot of do-do out there anyway. I love what Paul says. He says, I would that they were even cut off which trouble you. And however you want to take that, whatever member he's referring to. <laughs> for brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. You notice the whole part of this has to do with faith which worketh by love, and he talks about this love which many people in many generations through time focused on love as love being the justification. This is what happened during at least one era in Rome where people were being told that this is the means and method of salvation and justification to love, but this is error as well. This is a mark of God's love in a person, not to be confused that if we engage in endeavoring, we work to love somebody, that's as much as being under the law because the law said if you, if you would love God with all your heart, all your soul, essentially every fiber of your being, which, again, even walking in the spiritual realm, even Martin Luther, which I, I may get to, speaks of this and says not even an, an individual who is walking in the spirit would be able to fulfill that. Why? Because we're in flesh containers. That's like people who walk around and say, confess your sin. Let's talk about your sin. 
But you notice they'll never talk about the one scripture that is the banner for every child of God, which is Romans 3.23. All have sinned. All have fallen short of the glory, which said glory is Christ. Don't bother me or you amongst yourselves in trying to measure out your sinfulness or the, the, the measure that you think you are not or that you think you are. You're wasting your time and you're frustrating the grace of God. Whether you are the worst or in your eyes the best, it's irrelevant. Before God, he views it all the same. And whether you are, I love the fact that if you're really reading the Bible with the eyes of the Spirit, whether you, whether as the church depicted Mary Magdalene to be a woman of ill repute, which I don't think she was, but even given if she was, Christ had no problem being around that woman, and he had a problem being around the Pharisees. So think on these things the next time brother or sister so-and-so comes to talk to you about your life, your lifestyle, your habits. I think Christ would much rather be with a sinner like me or like you, knowing I'm being saved by grace, than with a religious, hypocritical, pharisaical ignoramus who thinks they're perfect in their eyes. Now let me go and perfect you. They're bound for some other destination. Stick with what you got in who you have, which is the love of Christ shed upon sinners like us and leave well enough alone over there because alone will be. It says, for all the law, verse 14, is fulfilled in one word. Even this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Here's more love being piled on. And a little bit of, um, mm, just a little, we'll call it a little twist. Paul sometimes says things that are, designed to trigger something, here it is. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed of one another. Well, you've got to see the spirit when you read it in the Greek in which it's said, he's not quite saying, go ahead and bite and devour one another. There's a little twist in there. We'll call it a twist of irony, if you will. I'm not sure that it's sarcasm, but definitely not meant to be read flat out just as it is. There's, there's a an essence in there that is very Pauline. He says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit and shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Too bad the board isn't shaped another way because I'd like to make a bigger circle. But let's start here. He says, walk in the Spirit. That Greek verb, and I won't get into the minutiae, I'm just going to tell you what it is, peripatet, is the Greek verb here, and it is a verb in the imperative. That's a command. You know, a lot of people have gotten angry at me when I've taught grammar because they don't, they don't like to see that imperative. They don't like it. <laughs> don't tell me what to do. Well, I'm not. The Bible's telling you. And if you don't want to listen to what's in the Word of God, then you have an attitude problem. You work it out with God. I'm just telling you, don't shoot the messenger. Okay? Walk. An imperative. This is just, we'll, we'll say just plain old, uh, as, you, as you read it, walking, walk in the Spirit. And I'll even give you a little bit more. It's present and active. That's important. Present means, present means ongoing and active. This is something you do. Now we talk about the Christian walk. This all sometimes used in a catchphrase, a Christian walk. We're talking about movement forward, not backward, momentum, progression of faith, walking forward, progressing in the faith, overcoming obstacles, because that's a little bit of what we're going to encounter right here, including temptation and the things that war against us internally and externally. So that walk, that word walk, which is just plain your movement in the faith, it's an imperative. Now there's other places where Paul in other writing, he says stand. Here he says walk, and you're not walking alone, you're walking in the spirit. I think that messages up until this point give you an idea that you are not 
fabricating this idea that you're walking, somehow you're walking spiritually. You're walking in the spirit. My reference often enough through this series has been about Nicodemus coming to Jesus at nighttime and asking him how a man can be born again. He says you must be born from above. That implant nature received in the heart by faith, nothing else. It's not worked. It's not obtained by any other means, but by faith that begins the walk. You begin to walk in the spirit. So he says this, I say then, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to another, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. You know, this is the honesty of Paul. We know our mindset, our frame. There's no cameras on you, just me looking at you. How many people said this week, I'm going to read my Bible a little bit more. Come on. Okay, be honest now. How many of you did? That's what I'm talking about. It's just like that. And there's, this is not an indictment. This is not a crime. It's to show you that the very things that you do indeed desire to do, that's a spiritual thing. But a lot of times you end up not doing. And you've got a perfect example of that in Romans 7. Except Paul's talking about things that are actually warring against. And he says, who shall deliver me from the body of this death, O wretched man that I am? And goes on to talk about his thankfulness for being in Christ later on into the 8th chapter. So he says, if you be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. And let's talk about this word, led. You be led. This word, Greek word from ago, I guess the, and I would tell you it is to be in submission, yielding, obediently, attentive to the things of God, the word of God. And this is probably quite important because this word to be led. In the Greek, another verb, so another action word in the indicative, which makes it a fact, and it is, it is present, ongoing, but it is passive. That means one leads you along, you follow. You are not setting the course. And why is this important? We're going to actually be making a circle here. Why is this important? These are key words I peeled out of this verse so that all the last messages we're able to kind of make sense of the I know what I desire to see myself here in these pages but the how to and this, is, this doesn't say well this is a recipe for success. Do this and this will happen. This is simply a little road map to say think on these things. Being led, being led of the Spirit, and of course he says you're not under the law. Now God led the children of Israel 40 years. And you've got God leading people through the Old Testament. But here's something that I find very interesting. When you come into the New Testament, you read about Christ in both Matthew 4 and Luke 4, and the temptation of Christ after he is baptized by John the Baptist. And it says that he was led into the wilderness by the Spirit to be tempted of the devil. I want you to just kind of hold that thought for a second. Because too many times people read this and they make it so spiritual that everybody's walking in slow motion on clouds, right? But the reality is when we are being led in the Spirit, by the Spirit, if Christ is our template, think of it this way. It doesn't say led of the Spirit to then not have any spiritual encounters with the devil. In fact, 
this is the problem that people don't tend to focus. It's like, well, I'm led of the Spirit. The Spirit, I'm walking in the Spirit. I'm led of the Spirit. Therefore, but go back and take a look at Christ first. Led of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And there is the key thing. He overcame the temptation. Man shall not live by bread alone. Turn, turn these stones to bread. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Everything was a design to foil Christ's ultimate plan of redemption, which is going to the cross, dying, raising again to reconcile the world, the plan of salvation. So why would we read this and think that even there we would not be having these encounters? Which is why elsewhere Paul says, put on the full armor of God. The walk itself in the spirit does not guarantee there is no fence that says, devil, stay away from this. In fact, you become the most enticing, delicious target because you essentially, like Paul, like myself, like any individual who's walking in faith in Christ, it's Christ in you. The attempt to attack that is an attempt to, again, attack Christ, not you, but Christ in you. So this being led shouldn't be understood as, well, therefore, I will be led in such a way that I will never encounter temptation. In fact, I would equally say the temptation will be more. Martin Luther talks about this in such a way that he says, no, it should be made clear that the temptations will actually be magnified. And it is this particular understanding, the flesh, very powerful, is always at war with the spirit, and the spirit is warring. Before someone actually engages in something, there's usually that little tug that says, don't go there. And there's also that tug that says, go there. Do it. Now you're in this conflict. Oh, it'll be, it'll be fine. It's just this one time, right? I'm, I'm speaking the language universal to all of us. And it's not just, oh, well, I don't know these things. I know them very well, and so do you. So he says, walk in the spirit. Be led in the spirit. Then he begins to talk about the works of the flesh are made manifest. And I'd like you to read this with me with these eyes. Too often people read this, and they read this as a laundry list, as if to say, ha, 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 you committed this sin. You do this. That's rather unfortunate because it tells me that those people fail to understand exactly what Paul is pointing out. First and foremost, let's get one thing straight. Why there is so much writing about fornication in Galatians and in Corinthians is look at where these churches were planted, pagan places where this type of behavior was not only acceptable, it was expected. Now, make the first application in context. Then move forward and you can start applying something that is universal. All of these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, let me stop right there. These are all perversions of something that God gave that was good. What was Adam's problem? Well, he probably had many, but <laughs> Adam's problem, at first God says it's not good for Adam, for man to be alone. He creates a helpmate for him, and the design of, of not being alone with a companion, a helpmate, in God's design was the perfect balance of a relationship which represented committedness and trust, which essentially is the very thing that he is still and has not gotten from man and is still looking for to this day. 
you want to talk about fornication outside of the context of Galatia and Corinth and so forth, the idea is proper relations that are in, again, committed committedness. The whole point is that these are all contrary. Not so much an exhaustive list. Idolatry, what does that represent? The very thing that right at the beginning of the book, false worship. If everything is a caricature that he's listing here, it's not so much a list of do's and don'ts as it is a caricature, a bending of God's intention, of the original intent of what God intended when he made Adam. Witchcraft, which that word in the Greek, pharmakia, we get our English word pharmacy, our drugs and pharmaceuticals. If you trace this word in its etymological development through time, it obviously represents potions and things alike that were done with the intent to cure, to either curse or bless. Isn't that a perversion of exactly what only God can do? Again, these are all hatred. You know, when I read this, I think to myself, there are some things God we can even read it in Paul's writing, right in the chapter we're in, about love. The love of God that is shed abroad in our hearts, and the very opposite of that, hatred. A perversion exactly in the opposite of what God intended. Variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. And if you really think about it, even one message many moons ago, I did a whole message on heresies of the church. Sex, divisions, people that come up with ideas outside of this book, and there is a long history of heresies that continue today. People just seem to be very unbothered and undisturbed at the reality of some of the very heretical practices that go on today. Now, listen, I'm in no means suggesting, suggesting that here at this church, and we're gathered here and we're perfect, no, we're a work in progress. But the idea is that everything, every design in here is the opposite. Envyings, murderers, think of the very beginning, Cain and Abel, murderers, people then thought, well, eye for an eye, Jesus came and he said, hey, listen, if you think the thought of killing, it's as bad as the deed. And this is what Paul is saying. It is the opposite, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, and as I've told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. I ask you to stop and just think about this for a minute. He's not saying lest anybody get in a panic right now. He's not saying that somebody who has a short falling, we all have sinned, therefore they will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's not what he's saying. But think of this in the, in the setting that it's in. He's talking to believers in the church. He's not saying those people out there. He's saying right in here. And there's a reason for that. And the reason still exists today. This is why I said to you a week or two ago, those people that say, well, I don't need a pastor, and I don't need someone to teach me. That's like the lady who said, I don't need anybody to tell me how to lose weight. I weigh 600 pounds, and I know what to do. And they came back two months later, and she weighed an extra 50 pounds. She knew what to do. She just wouldn't do it. This is the thing of discipline. People, I'm sure, know what to do. They just won't do it. And if they do, the reality is that God gave some gift ministers, Paul says, to the church for the equipping of the saints, to bring them to a better knowledge of Christ and to bring them to completion. He says, these that do these things, he says, they shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Remember Jesus' words, he said, blessed are the meek, 
That's not milk toast, but those that have come under bitten bridle. I, we translated that word one time, pratis, in the Greek. Bitten bridle. Not milk toast, not, oh, I'm not sure. Those that are wearing essentially the bitten bridle, God is the one who's got it under control. He's got the reins, if you will, your heart. He says, they shall inherit the earth. Distinguish that in the Beatitudes versus elsewhere where Christ is talking and he talks about inheriting the kingdom of God. And they basically bring you back to about the same place. Except one has to do with the end, when God recreates all things and makes all things new. And the other has to do with from the now into eternity. If you think they lead to the same place, they ultimately do. There were a lot of troublemakers at Galatia. There were a lot of troublemakers at Corinth. There were a lot of troublemakers at Ephesus. There were a lot of troublemakers just about everywhere. Right clear into the book of Revelation, John is writing to the seven churches, and he talks about the Jezebel, the, the folks who were the Nicolaitans. He says, by the way, the words that are penned there, he says, which I also hate. That's God speaking. He's allowed to. That's his prerogative. But it's kind of interesting when you think about it, we tend to read this and make it a list and check and check. Or here comes, you know, brother or sister so-and-so. They're the fruit inspectors, and they'll ask you the question, did you commit such and such a sin? My answer is, go stuff a sock in it. Yeah. I know that was so Christian. But I say that because... I do not frustrate the grace of God. I do not do despite to the shed blood of Christ. I do not insult my Lord and Savior who died for me and gave himself for me that I might live for some uneducated person in the word of God to abase my salvation in my Savior. That's why I said put a sock in it. Now, the fruit of the Spirit, don't you like my transition, right? The great segue. The fruit of the Spirit, love, and we're not talking about love that you fabricate or I fabricate. This is love. These are, remember, if it's the fruit of the Spirit, picture a tree. And fruit that grows on a tree is not produced from, although it appears on the outside, the genesis of the fruit comes from within and manifests itself outwardly, each in its season. So the fruit of the Spirit, singular, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, Meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. Let me say one thing on this. John 3, you must be born from above. That's what's planted in your heart. Walk in the spirit, you're led. That is, you are essentially submitting and obeying, following. You're not following somebody telling you to do something crazy. You're, you're following, you're running to the voice of the sayer within that book. And what will come out of this as we go will be singular. Fruit is singular. It is singular. And picture what is said there. If this is the deposit of God's nature in you, what comes out from this deposit is an outraying of who God is as put on display in a microcosm in you flowing out of you. That is love, agape, not phileo. That's his love placed in you, not the love that, oh, we got to love one another. Let me come here. Let me love you. Let me, let me show you how happy I am. I'm full with joy. Let's be happy, 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 joy, joy, joy. It's not that type either. It's the joy that Christ said when he talked about that your joy may be fulfilled. When he talked about peace, he said, my peace, I give you. All of these things are what come from above, placed in our heart. And as we continue to walk and to be led, let me get the next word because the next word is quite close by. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. And here we go in verse 25. If we live in the spirit, if we live, that's a verb 
in the indicative, which means the fact, present, ongoing, and active. That's you. Of course, well, of course I live. But read carefully. If you live in the spirit, listen to what Paul says. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Essentially, the very essence of life now is not defined by simply I breathe, but the life that I have, which is the new life. We are to rise buried in the likeness of his death by baptism, to rise, to walk in newness of life. And that life is a life that is, this is all continuous. We're, we're moving in a direction. And by the way, we're not moving backwards. Don't think because I'm making this circle that I'm suggesting along the way you're going to go through these perfectly because no one does and no one can. And I stand here as plain as day to tell you your best efforts are put into the category of works. Your best I'll try to do is put in the category of works. This is why I said if God is not doing this ministry, if God is not working through me to help me to bring instruction and clarity in the word, then I don't want to do it. I don't want to be involved in something that has to be an effort of my labor, which will count for nothing, and it will count for nothing for you in eternity. That's the concern that I have when people say, well, why all this, you know, you, you get really worked up about this. Why? Because there's a lot of momentum to try and get people to kind of see, I am not interested in the work of you applying to do the thing I'm interested in you opening up your mind and your heart and letting God, through this implant that he's placed in you, show you, guide you, and direct you to walk, to be led, and to live. That is a conscious awareness, day by day, the reality of faith, the reality of temptation, the reality of stumbling blocks that are placed in your way, the choices that you have as you are walking and being led, there's, there's a choice at every corner. You can choose, you can choose to do whatever you want, whatever you, whatever you desire. But has it come to you? Because it's come to me. I've been convicted many times in my spirit and in my heart. No, that's not the way to go. That's not the way to handle something like that. That's not that it's not because I think I ought to do this thing. Everybody has that, what Dr. Scott coined, a universal sense of oughtness. We're not discussing that. We're discussing about that little small voice, that little tugging, something that says, no, that's not the way. Why? Because you've opened your mind and your heart to the word of God. You've read it, and something inside, which I'm telling you is this implant nature, that says, no, you may still go the other way, and go against. That happens all the time. But the point is to be aware. It's practicing the awareness of God with you at all times. It doesn't mean that you're going to accomplish. As I said, the worst thing that could happen is somebody saying, now that you know, go out there and do. I've never said that to you. And anybody who says that I have is delusional and a liar. Why? Because I realize how difficult it is because the bent Nature of the flesh is always desiring, maybe like in the spirit of Elijah, without the spirit of Elijah. I care more about God and his word. The words of a famous man who once said, I have a cover-up for God in case he doesn't come through. You know who said that, right? Yeah. That's the flesh, the wonderful part of the flesh that may care enough about God's work but still says, well, I can't let God be disgraced. Well, and I understand, believe me, when you love God, that's the last thing you want to have happen. But I'll stick with what Paul says, and I'll gladly be a fool for Christ's sake. If, if the lesson is whatever it is, then I accept it. I'm not going to be like the one that says I can only accept the good and I cannot accept the bad. I take it all because it's from God's hand, regardless of what. 
and realize if this is his work, let me start with me. You can say it for you. If this is his work, I'm pointing at me. You who are listening on radio, I'm pointing to myself. You can point to yourself. If this is his work, he's able to enter in and work in me and through me. Not me working to work the work, but he working in me through me to accomplish his purpose. And this is exactly what Paul said to the Philippians. Work out your salvation with phobia and trembling, fear and trauma, if you will. Why? Because it's God who worketh in you to do and to will his good. Worketh in you. And this is what I'm talking about right here. This is what Paul is talking about. So he says, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. They look like two of the same words, walk, but this is a different Greek word. I've referenced it many times, stoikin. This word is a, a verb in the subjunctive, which means mood of possibility, and it is in the present, again, and active. And this word, in its secular use, was originally used in the secular realm of, in a military capacity of rank and file, to come under the rank and file, reporting for duty, yes, sir. How many people within the body of Christ would say they're reporting for duty, yes, sir? Way too many people in the church come in, you're not going to tell me to report for duty, I'm, I'm my own person. Who are you to tell me anything? Okay, you want to be your own boss? Why am I telling you this? Because there's something really important about this one word that brings us all together. If you look back with me in the fourth chapter of Galatians, in the 25th verse, it's regarding Hagar, and it says, For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and the King James says, And answereth to Jerusalem, which is now and is in bondage with her children. That word answereth, has the prefix su, which is with, and stoike, our same word we're looking at as to walk in the spirit. What this is saying is Hagar has come underneath as the same, in the same class and the same type as Jerusalem, regarding Jerusalem, the law, bondage, whatnot. In gendereth, she is in a classification, in a rank and file coming under that, which essentially she reports to, if you want to put it in the military perspective. Here, we begin our walk, we are led, we live in the spirit, and here we come under as rank and file, the leading, our spiritual commander, if you will, Christ, the first goer, the author of our faith, who has given us the promise of the Spirit placed in us, gives us this concept here now to look at and really pay attention to. This is to come under in rank and file, and here we go. And we begin to walk, and we begin to be led, and it, this is a daily event. This is not a one-time thing. It's daily. As you move and have your being, and you're moving forward. You're not moving in reverse. This is very key right here. This one is very, very key. When I said it's, subju it's subjunctive, it means mood of possibility. It opens the door to the fact that some may come and may not want to come under the rank and file of the one who's leading them. And I do not speak of a human being. Now I speak of the person of the Holy Spirit. We're not talking about loony things like people rolling around on the ground or people falling over at somebody's breath or a coat. We're talking about the actual guidance that God has given the thing that internally will call it your internal GPS to be able to find your way sorting out your personal life, because I'm not wanting to interfere in your personal life, as you live and have your being. And when you begin to look at all of this, you understand, I, at least for me, it becomes very clear, God's not going to force us. Oh, the imperative is to begin to, to walk, but God's not going to force us nor is he going to put things on us and kind of give us this, well, you're going in this direction because I said so. This is why I use the illustration of Christ being led by the Spirit into the wilderness 
and was tempted by the devil. Why? Because part of this trip, as you look at this, your life, part of this along the way will have intrusions, obstacles, scandals, temptations, whatever you want to call them, things that are absolutely present every single day. They will confront you. They will taunt you. They will make themselves so obtainable to you, so perhaps even desirable to you. I think I'll save this for festival because it's probably better read in completion to this message on festival. But this is what Martin Luther talks about when he says he was speaking about Jerome, one of the church fathers, and how Jerome thought it was great perhaps to be out in the desert, isolated by himself, and only have water and maybe a morsel of bread. But did he actually, this purported saint of the church, in Jerome's own words, he lusted more while he was alone and in the desert. In fact, he envisioned himself to be part, this is part of this book, he envisioned himself to be part of a chorus entertaining, feasting his eyes upon women. That's Jerome, saint of the church. He burned with, and here's a man who knew the scriptures, burned with more earnest desire as he was removed from the reality, placed into the desert, versus when he was amidst those that were in the bustling world, if you will, and had lived and had his being in his normal environment. These things will come at you and I don't care if you put yourself like Jerome in the desert and you want to live in a monastery. They'll come at you. This was not written for people living simply some monastic life, pastors and uh, priests and the whatnot. This is written for those people earnestly wrestling down the battle which is lifelong between the spirit and the flesh. Now how interesting, if you were to take this chapter... You know, in the olden days here, we, one time we had an overhead projector. We took it down to the cathedral briefly. But you remember you could take an overhead projector and put plastic, you'd write on it, right? And you'd beam it up onto the screen. Imagine that what I've just done is on a piece of plastic and you can, it's an image of something, it's that image. I could take John 15 and superimpose another piece of plastic, which would be John 15, right over this, and it would be saying essentially the same thing. He says, without me, you can do nothing. He says, except you abide in me and I in you, that you what? Bear much fruit. And then he talks, Jesus begins to talk about the purging process of those who are fruit bearers, mind you, and that not all yield the same fruit. Later on, he'll talk about in the parable of the sower, some yield 30, 60, 90, not all yield the same, but are yielding fruit. And it is not fruit, by the way. This is the thing that it came to me as I, I wanted to say, I'm going to bring this all together. The fruit is not for me to enjoy, and it's not even for you to enjoy. It is fruit presented unto the Lord. The very thing that he's placed in me to yield is not for you, or you may be the, the beneficiary, your brother, sister, your family, your friend. They may be beneficiaries of it, but the one who is to benefit the most, the design, is it is fruit rendered back to him. It's the fruit of what he placed in you, something returning to him that he looks down at and says, this is well-pleasing to me. Not somebody else coming and saying, hmm, I wonder if that's going to grow at all because <laughs> I don't see it. My point is, you know, when you see God repeating over and over again, you begin to recognize that there's a pattern. The pattern here is very simple. People say, well, I'm frustrated. I, I, I've come to an impasse, and none of this makes any sense to me. You know, I'm, I'm walking, and, and I, I don't know if I'm really being led, and they, here, here we go with all the complications. Just simplify this thing. You don't need somebody to give you a step one and a step two. I drew the circle to show you this is ongoing. This is every single day, present, ongoing, and active, present, ongoing, present, ongoing, and active. These are things that you and I will keep on keeping on as long as we have breath in our lungs. And the only time I can tell you that I've ever seen it be a complete loss is when somebody just completely gives up. They say, I just can't. Which, by the way, 
I'm going to have to agree again with Dr. Scott when he said, God hates quitters, and I do too. The fact of the matter is, if God pulled you out of the gutter, and he's no respecter of person, he doesn't care where he pulled you from, where he found you, but then you've been rescued and delivered. This isn't an admonition, now you better walk the straight and narrow. This is to keep your focus on him, the one who called you, the one who saved you, and to recognize, yes, there is a pattern. There is something to this. There is someone, as I said in one of those messages, helping me along, the one alongside me. I don't have to try and do it. I, by faith, like Paul, the life I live, yet not I, but Christ that lives in me, I don't have to manufacture this. There are days, and you'll have them and I will have them, where I just can't see it. Yet I know even to trust God when I am in darkness and have no light. I know to not start lighting matches of my own doing, but rather to commit my way and keep following, although I cannot see where or how. My faith says, keep following, keep on walking, keep on coming under the one who is speaking to me through the word, that this direction is not the direction of man or woman or of an individual. It's not machinations of humankind, but it's God saying, keep on walking. You let me keep leading you. And the more that you keep walking, being led, living in the spirit and coming under, something actually happens. Because you'll look back at the last couple of years of your life and it'll be an honesty time for you as it has been for me in asking yourself the question, was I really following the Lord or was I following what I wanted to do and putting a halo on it? Which is what most of Christianity ends up doing anyway. Why? I, I asked for the Lord's will, but then I went out and did my own thing because he didn't answer me so he must have put a blessing on it because you know he was silent about the whole thing but the fact of the matter is even in times where there is no answer there is one you keep walking by faith you keep the mindset which says God has placed this gift in you and in me I am not going to try and figure out the how to's of every minutia that comes my way I know the wiles of the devil. I know the workings of the devil. I know the program and plan of the devil. Very simply put, if I can just be shaken out of this walk, shaken out of being led to the mind of confusion that says, you're not being led, or you're being led astray, to not even living my life every day by faith in Christ, then I don't have, then I come up with the attitude, I don't have to submit to anybody. And presto, before you know it, although you think you're free, oh, you're free, all right. You're free in the devil's camp, actually in his slave camp. You just don't see the fence he's put around you to bring you in, corral you. For the time, his design has been accomplished. This is why I tell people who wrestle with addiction, you have escaped the devil's labor camp. And believe me, once you have, he will come after you with five other things. If that one thing that you've ceased to do, he'll come at you with five other things to try and get you back because those things are what he binds you with. My Bible tells me Christ breaks the chains that bind. He frees. And this is why Christ says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free. That is not a license, as he talks about in Romans if grace abounds, you know, go sin all the more. Consider what he says, to whom you yield your members, this is to whom you're going to serve, and you make a decision. I'm either going to serve myself, and essentially by serving myself, I serve the devil, or I'm going to serve the Lord, albeit in a frail way, albeit faltering, albeit I'm a sinner, and I can't do anything of my own but Christ and the Spirit of God placed in me will give me the guidance to keep walking and claim the victory. This victory goes straight to the end of the book where we're told about overcomers. How do you overcome? Keep on walking. Be led by the Spirit. Live in the Spirit. Come under the guidance and rule of the Spirit as your, you want to call it your military uh, rank and file, and fruit will come. 
And not fruit put on display for people to examine and pick over, but fruit that is rendered back to God, that is an acceptable gift that he looks at and says, this is my beloved son, this is my beloved daughter, these are my children, just like Christ when he hung on the cross, just like when he was baptized, in whom I am well pleased. This thing that we think is for others really is rendered back to him. It's for him. It's for his glory. And when that happens, something remarkable happens. I get out of myself and I look at the thing that I'd rather be doing, which is pleasing God, which I must tell you over the years, maybe I haven't been the most pleasing, but in my heart of hearts, it's the desire that's there to render the fruit that he might look upon it and say, this thing that I, he brought forth in me, that wonderful gift of the person of the Holy Spirit working to help me, that I might one day stand in his presence looking like him, not looking like me, not bringing my ideas, looking and being conformed to his image and likeness. And this, my friends, is what exactly this gift brings to us, the ability to come and approach God in a closer way with the eyes of the Spirit that says, he's helping me to make my way home, and I will keep walking, keep being led, keep living, and keep coming under because I will trust him no matter what. That's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.